Welcome to this video on arrays and lists, which is continuing our series on Python programming. So this week, rather than give you all of the information, all the theory about the programming that you're going to be practicing um, at the front, I thought it might be helpful to put it together into a video. That way you can watch it at your own pace and you can go and do a bit of practice programming um, after doing a little bit of theory and then we can return to a bit more theory and so on. So hopefully you will find this a beneficial way of doing it. Uh, it also means that we can go over things or even you can go over things again um, in clinic uh, and just get more help um, when I'm not available. So we're gonna see how this goes this week. So a quick recap uh, on variables. So far we have used variables to store single items of data. So that might be a string, which is text, integers, which is whole numbers, floats, which are numbers with decimal points, or Boolean values like true or false. Now, the thing to we uh, sort of need to remember about variables is that they're like boxes that you can put data in. Uh, and if we want to recall that data later, then we use the identifier or the name of the box or the variable. So in our picture here, we've got a box uh, this is our variable, it's called player name, and it's currently storing a string. We know that because we've got quotes, and that string is Bob. So this player name variable is storing Bob as its value. Sometimes we are going to want to store multiple values uh, rather than just a single value. For example, if we were going to store the names of all the pupils in a class. So we can do this with variables, it's completely possible, but it's not ideal. We would need several variables, one for each member of the class. So in a class of 20 people, there'd be 20 separate variables named pupil one, pupil two, pupil three, pupil four, pupil five. And you can see that this will become quite messy quite quickly. In fact, if we want to pass this information around uh, our program, so if we want to take all of the names in the class and put that into a function, maybe to print all the names out, or to, I don't know, store grades for them, we would need to individually reference every single one of those variables, which would be a complete pain. There is an answer, and that is something called an array. Now, an array, if, uh, if someone said to you, hmm, what should we have for dinner? And I said, you have an array of options. It means multiple. It means you've got lots of choices. So an array in computing is a data structure that can store multiple values. So far we've dealt with variables that store single values, but arrays can store multiple values. Uh, so they can be assigned to a single variable, um, such as menu, and it could have, I don't know, fish and chips, sausages, pizza, all sorts of different options assigned within it. Um, so you assign it to a single value, but it contains multiple values. So let's try and make that a little bit easier to understand. You can think of an array like a set of pigeonholes. If you've never ever seen a pigeonhole, these are what they look like. They are basically boxes that you might get in post rooms. And uh, for example, the, all members of staff have got their own pigeonhole in college. and each one will have a name on it. So I have one that says Mr. Dinnick, and in there, any letters or work that you might hand in or anything will go into there, and I'll pick it up later. So an array is like pigeonholes. You've got multiple slots, we call them elements, each of which can contain an item of data. Each element has its own index. In the case of arrays, that is a, a unique number that is used to access that data inside the slot. So, let's think back to our class. If we were to use an array, we can store all the names of the pupils in the class easily. Here we are with one single array, and it's called pupils, and it contains five values. Bob, Jane, Dave, Harry, Lucy. And if I want to pass all this data into another function or any other part of the program, all I have to do is pass the variable pupils and it will take with it all those five values. Now remember I said that there are indexes. So each element in this array has its own unique index, and in Python they start at zero. That's just a sort of a computing thing. Lots of programming languages do this. So the first one is zero, the second one is index one, the third one is index two, 
the fourth one is index 3, the fifth one is index 4. If we want to access the data within an array, we just state the name of the array, which is pupils, followed by the index of the item. So here's a little bit of Python down here. So if we did print pupils square brackets, now this is something in arrays, you always use square brackets when you're then specifying the index. This is index zero, i.e. the first item, and it spits out Bob, which is what we had here. If this said print pupils two, that would be zero, one, two, Dave. Okay, let's do a short demo to show you how this works. Okay, so here we are in Replit. I'm going to start a new Python program and I'm going to create an array uh, or called pupils. So I have a, a variable, I should say more specifically, it's a variable called pupils storing an array. So pupils equals, so that's just as we would normally do, but because it's an array, we're going to use a square bracket. And then inside the square bracket, we can put all of the values we want to store. Bob, let's give him a capital B. Uh, and then between each um, element, we use a comma. Okay, so Bob, Jane, Dave, Harry, Lucy. Close the square bracket. That has now created a variable called pupils, which stores an array containing five different values, Bob, Jane, Dave, Harry, and Lucy. So, like I said before, we can print out items from this array using our print statement, like before, the name of the variable storing the array, pupils, and the index of the element we want. So let's try index zero and see if it does give us Bob. Let's run our program and see what happens. Fantastic, and there we go, Bob. I told you that if we put two in, we'd get Dave. Let's see if I was telling the truth. And there's Dave. If we want to, we can actually print all the values in an array, we can see the whole um, structure of the array just by printing the name of the variable that stores the array. And it shows us each of our items in the array. What I'd like you to do now is go to our Replit classroom and then you're going to open the arrays and lists assignment and I want you to have a go at task one. As ever, you'll see the instructions down the side. You just need to do task one for this bit, okay? Ignore the code here, we're going to use that in task four. Don't delete it. Pop your code here where it says task one. You can put a few enters in if you want to make some space and type your code in there. Once you've done that, come back to the video and we're going to go on to learn a little bit more about what we can do with these arrays. Okay, so hopefully you've finished task one now and you got on okay with it. Uh, so we're going to carry on learning a bit about arrays uh, and specifically, um, at this point, I need to tell you that Python doesn't actually use arrays. Instead, it uses something called lists. Now, lists are a bit like arrays plus. They're better than arrays. Computer science uh, uses the term array to describe a fixed size data structure. So if you were to sort of use an array in, uh, in, in some programming languages, you have to specify how many items it can store. Um, so maybe you would say it can store 10 items and once you put in your 10 items and you filled it up you can't add anything new to it. Python doesn't do that. Python lets you continually make the list of items bigger and bigger and bigger as new items are added. In addition, lists come with some useful methods uh, for using or manipulating the data that is contained and we're going to have a little look at that now. So. Um, here's an example of some code. So in that first line, we're going to create again um, a variable called pupils and we're going to store an empty list. And this is how if we don't know the items we want to put in the list at the time that we run our program, we can just use open square bracket, close square brackets, and that creates an empty list. Then we're going to add a new item, Mike, to our list using the dot append method of the list. So we refer to the list, pupils, dot append and we put in Mike. Now this dot append, this is like a function that belongs to the list. So you have to specify the list that you want to call this, we call it a method, upon. Okay, so pupils dot append Mike will add Mike into our list. 
On the next line, we do the same thing. We're just adding another pupil called Lottie. That gets, she gets added into our, into our list. And then if I wanted to print the items in our list, we could do print pupils and it would say Mike and Lottie. And we can use the remove uh, method here. So pupils.remove will remove Mike from the list. And we can prove that by printing pupils again and we'll see it just contains Lottie. Uh, a few other things we can do. Um, these are all the same, creating a new empty list, appending Mike and Lottie to it. Um, and like I've just shown you before, we can print out a specific item. So the first item in our list will be the one with index zero, that would print Mike. If we remove Mike and print pupils zero again, now we get Lottie because Mike has shifted out of our list. Lottie has moved down to the front of the list, so she's now got the first index position. So whereas when she was the second item, she would have been index one, now because she's the only item, she is index zero. Let's demo that again, just to make that clear. Let's just write up that code. So pupils with an empty list, then let's append Mike to the list. Let's append Lottie to the list. Now let's just print pupils and see what we've got. Okay, Mike, Lottie, just as we'd expect. Okay, now let's remove Mike. And let's print pupils again. So there's our first print with Mike and Lottie in there. And here's our second print where it's just Lottie. Okay, let's again try uh, what we had on that second page. So let's just try printing just the first item in each state of the list. And the first time we get Mike, because Mike is the first item in the list, after we've removed Mike, if we do pupil zero again, we get Lottie the second time. Okay, so now I'd like you to go back to uh, the arrays and lists assignment in Replit and do task two. So one of the really good things about lists in Python is that they are iterable. That means you can iterate or loop over them using for loops. This is really useful uh, if you're going to be doing a common action with each of the items in the list. For example, printing out each item of data, or maybe you're going to uh, go through each item in a list and add them all up if they're all values, or you might check if they're all equal to some sort of keyword that you're looking for or something like that. So if you've got a list of items, you can use a for loop to go over every item and process each item in turn until you've done all the items in the list. It's really, really useful. To do this, uh, it's, we set up our list in the same way as we've done before. So we have a variable that's gonna store the list. We append some items to the list. But in this bit of code, we're going to print a little header just saying pupils in the class. So that's just gonna print a straight line, pupils in the class. And then we've got our for loop. And it says here, for p in pupils print p. Okay, let's break this down a bit. Well, what's pupils? Pupils is our list of pupils. Okay, so pupils is Mike and Lottie at the moment. For p in pupils, this means, um, this is a variable. We've created a temporary variable called p. And we're saying for each item in that list, refer to it as p. So uh, that's how we can do print p and it will print Mike and then it will print Lottie the second time the for loop runs around and once you've run out of items in the list it will just stop running the for loop you don't have to tell it how many times the for loop should run for it knows to do this for every item in that list we can do the similar sort of thing with numbers let's imagine we've got a list here called values and I'm creating it with some built-in values, one, four, six, 22, and three. All of those are integers because they're not in quotes, so those are real numbers ready for Python to do some maths. Then we're gonna create a variable called sum, and we'll set it to zero. And now we're using for loop again, for v in values. Well, values is our list of values. v is a variable whose contents will be each value 
in the values list in turn. So the first time this for loop runs, the value or contents of v will be 1. The second time it runs, it will be 4. The third time the for loop runs, the contents inside v will be 6. And so on until we get to the last item where v is 3. Then within our for loop, we're going to take our sum variable, which starts off as 0, and we're going to make it equal to itself plus the value v. So the first time this runs, it will be 0. Sum is equal to 0 plus 1, so it will become equal to 1. The second time this runs, it will be sum is equal to itself, which is 1, plus v. v being the second item in the list will be 4, so sum becomes 5, and so on. Once we've finished running our for loop, then we break out of our indentation and we just say print the sum of all the numbers in the list is and then we can add sum on the end and that will print out the total value of those items added together. So yet again, let's demonstrate how this works. Starting first with our looping over the items in our class. So here we are, we've got pupils, we've got our array, we've added Mike, Lottie. Let's just add another pupil for the sake of it, uh, Dan. Okay, now we're going to create uh, a line that says pupils in the class. And now we want to print each of the pupils. So we can do a for loop for P. This could be anything. It could be for, for person in pupils, for student in pupils. I just use P because it's easy to write. For P in pupils, colon, because what we're doing next is going to be an indented block of code that belongs to the for loop. For p in pupils, print p. Let's run it. There we go. Pupils in the class, Mike, Lottie and Dan. If we wanted to, we could add a little bit of formatting to this. So we could do uh, something like this. That looks nice. Mike, Lottie and Dan. Simple. Let's try and do the, uh, the numbers example now. So we had a list of values equal to 1, 4, 6, 22, 3. Sum equals 0. That's our sort of baseline sum. We're going to be adding to that as we go through our for loop. Now, for v in values, sum is equal to sum plus v. Once we've done that, we can print the sum of the numbers in the list is, and I'm going to put a uh, sum on the end. Let's see if this works. The sum of the numbers in the list is 36. 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 6 is 11, plus 22 is 33, plus 3 is 36. There we go, it's worked, it's added them all up. Great, okay, uh, so that's actually probably one of the most complicated things you can do uh, with lists, is looping over them, uh, but hopefully you've understood what I've done there, but just to help bed that knowledge in, I would like you now to go back to Replit, back to our arrays and lists assignment, and complete tasks three and four. Great, well hopefully now you've finished uh, task three and four and hopefully you've got on okay with it and if not then you've sought out someone else next to you who has managed to do it and you've worked through it together. The last thing that you need to know about lists uh, are that strings are lists. Strings, text, data, messages, just you know, whatever kind of anything in quotes, they're actually made up of lots of individual characters joined together. So a string is a list where each element is an individual character in the string. This means that you can do all the things you can do with other lists on strings, such as looping over each letter in the string to then do something with that letter or that character. So let's have a look at how we might do this. Here is a variable called message and it's storing a string hello. So each one of the H, E, L, L, O, that's a separate element in our list. And we could print out uh, the value of, let's say, the E by doing print message, square brackets, 1, because that would get us this, the second element in the list. Anyway, here we are. We've got a, a message called hello. 
We've got another variable uh, called scramble, and that's equal to a blank string. And what we're going to do now is we're going to do another for loop. This time I'm creating uh, a for loop that's going to loop over the message string. And the variable I'm using to store each letter or each character is called letter. So for each letter in message, now we're going to do some bit more advanced processing. We're going to do an if statement on that letter. If the letter is a lowercase l, I want to add a squiggly line called a, a tilde to, um, to our scramble string. So plus equals means uh, it means what you do is you get the value and you add itself plus what's coming up here. So we're adding, so scramble equals scramble plus the little tilde. Um, if it's not a lowercase l, then just add the original letter onto scramble. So let's imagine, let's, let's walk this through. The very first letter we're going to reach is an H, capital H. So it's going to say, is that letter a lowercase l? No, it's not. So it's going to go to else. So we're going to add scramble, which is blank. We're going to add to scramble the letter itself, which is the capital H. Okay, so scramble currently contains an H. Now we're going to go on to the next letter, which is a lowercase e. Is the letter a lowercase l? No, it's not. So add the letter onto scramble. So scramble now contains h, e. Go to the next letter. Now it's going to test, is it a lowercase l? And it is. So we're going to add a tilde sign. So now scramble will say h, e, tilde. Then it goes to the next letter, which is another l. So it's going to be h, e, tilde, tilde. And then it'll get to the final letter, which is a lowercase o. Well, it's not an l, so it'll go to the else. And it'll just add that lowercase l onto the scramble string, and if we print the scramble string out, it will print out H-E squiggle squiggle O. Nice little bit of a kind of secret code for us there. Let's see that in action. So back to Python, I'm going to erase what I've done before. Okay, let's try this out. So we're going to say message equals hello, scramble equals blank string, for letter in message colon if letter equals l scramble is equal to itself plus oops the little tilde sign else scramble helps if I spell it correctly is equal to itself plus the original letter once we're finished print scramble see what happens. There we go, there's hello with our L's scrambled up. If we wanted to, we could add an elif and we could check for some other letters. Uh, if it's an O, let's have scramble equal to itself plus an exclamation mark. Now you can see we're starting to scramble up our message nicely there. <laughs> OK, that should be more than enough information to give you the skills you need to go on to now complete task five. Once you finish task five, uh, have a go at the extension tasks. It's going to take everything I've shown you so far, but a little bit further. You're going to have to apply that knowledge uh, and do something new and original with it. But there should be enough information in the instructions to guide you through what you need to do.